Hello and welcome to Lisa Loves and thank you for joining me again today for another case. Um, as usual I do like to do my cases based on programs, documentaries I've watched recently and this one is a real doozy. This is a documentary that is just premiered on Showtime. It is called Outcry. It's a five-part docuseries and it covers the case of a high school footballer by the name of Greg Kelly. If you haven't heard of it, if you're not aware of any of the facts, um, stay tuned. Um, I'm not going to go into everything. It's such a long and complicated case with so many twists and turns that it would be impossible to go into everything without being sat here for hours. So massive recommendation, go check it out. It's called Outcry and it was directed by Pat Condellis. Um, I'm going to go into the story for you, most of the main points, um, and I'd be really interested to hear your viewpoints in the comments. <sighs> So before I start, I will say the information that I've obtained for this video is from both the documentary and from further research. Please feel free to correct me in the comments if I get any details wrong, but please try to be courteous. Um, we shouldn't really need to put these disclaimers at the start of videos, but um, really you get a pronunciation wrong, a tiny little fact, people are all over you. So in advance, my apologies. Please feel free to correct me, but please be courteous when doing so. So, without further ado, let's get into the story of Greg Kelly. Greg was a 17-year-old, very talented football player from a little town called Leander, which is 25 miles north of Austin in Texas. His mother, Rosa, had actually been married to a gentleman called Carlos, and they had two children, and very sadly, Carlos passed away. Rosa moved to and she met and married a gentleman called Douglas Sr. They went on to have the rest of the siblings and they were very, very happy together, very happy family life. Douglas very much accepted um, the two children that Rosa already had as his own and they settled into very happy family life in Texas. But unfortunately, that happy life was to be quite short-lived. Um, the family would encounter numerous obstacles. The father, Douglas, unfortunately was hospitalised with a severe stroke and at the same time Rosa was actually struggling to deal with a brain tumour herself. Now there were a lot of siblings, some of these were older than Greg, didn't live in the same address. Um, Greg was 17 at the time, he was very young, he was in the middle of high school. As I said he was a very talented football player, very well known. He already had a free ticket to the University of Texas to play football for them. Um, and he had a best friend by the name of Jonathan McCarty. The reason I bring him up is because his mother, Shama, offered to take um, Greg into her home with obviously his best friend, her son, Jonathan, um, and it seemed like the perfect plan. Um, Rosa spoke to Shama and obviously she was very grateful, thanked her for this opportunity while her and her husband were trying to get well again, and Greg moved in with Jonathan and his mother, Shama. Shama was also a booster for the local football team. She was very much into it, very supporting of it, and was a big fan of Greg's. Now, Shama's son, Jonathan, also played football with Greg, but he was an average player. Um, she even said herself that he wasn't going to make the big time, but Greg was so talented that the chances were that he would. I think this must have caused a little bit of resentment between Jonathan and Greg. Um, Greg seemed to have it all. He had a beautiful girlfriend called Gabri Anderson that he'd been with for three years. They were very happy. It is alluded to in the documentary that it's quite possible that Jonathan actually really liked Gabri. Um, so he was envious of that side of things. Um, Greg was an amazing football player. He had severe talent. He was a very fit young man, trained very, very hard. And even his own mother, even Jonathan's own mother, um, seemed to be given more attention and praise to Greg than she was to her own son. So at Shama's home where Greg moved in, there was a daycare facility. She looked after children and that is the place that Greg's life would be turned completely upside down. So in July 2013, a mother of a four-year-old that was in Shama's care came forward to say that her son had made an allegation of abuse against Greg. I won't go into specific details as to what was said, you can look that up for yourself, but she did make a allegation of abuse against her four-year-old son. The four-year-old had um, basically just used the name Greg. So it's worth noting, um, before I go any further in this, that Greg and Jonathan were best friends, but they also looked incredibly alike. So much so, not only would they pass for brothers, they were confused by people all the time. They looked like twins. These lads looked very, very alike. Um, I'll put a picture there for you to look at, but you can see how similar they are. So I feel that's very relevant to what I'll go on to next. In July of 2013, 
the mother of a four-year-old in Shama's care would come forward to say that her son had made an allegation against Greg. The little boy only knew the name Greg, he wasn't aware of his surname, he was only four years old and he made an allegation of abuse against Greg. So the child said that this abuse happened on two occasions. He came forward on the 13th of July and the police basically speculated that given the information they were told that the alleged abuse most likely happened on the 12th of July. It's important to note at this stage that Greg had actually moved out of the address in June and he could prove where he was on the 12th of July and it wasn't actually within the house, but things would just spiral out of all control. So on August 9th, Greg is actually arrested. And a few days after this, another child comes forward to make allegations against Greg also. Now the order to tell you this story the documentary was very back and forth, but it's a really, really good documentary, but I'm going to try and do this in a linear sense to give you an idea as I'm talking about things. Some of these things didn't come to light until later, but I want to tell you as we go. So Greg was arrested on the 9th of August. There was no physical proof here. There was obviously the two victims, um, both very young children, but ridiculously the police didn't visit the address, look in the rooms, um, no pictures were taken, no evidence was taken. One child came forward and made an allegation against someone called Greg, who obviously very vehemently denied these allegations. And what was amazingly learnt later is that the lead detective on the case, a Chris Daly, actually contacted parents of other children within the daycare facility to tell them what had happened and to find out if anything similar had happened to their child. This is what provokes another child to come forward. He is taken in for questioning and we actually see the questioning in the documentary. Um, this detective actually questions this boy. He walks into the room with his weapon, might I add, and he is not qualified to interview that child. He may be a police detective but they have professionals that are there to interview very young children. This child is, it pretty much looks like coerced to say what he says. Um, he denies anything at first, but this detective keeps pushing and pushing. And again, this will be said later, but I want to tell you now that the child later retracted the statement and said that nothing had happened. So as it stands, there is one allegation against Greg, this four year old boy, no physical evidence, no one has searched the house and I would like to go back to the fact that Greg and Jonathan look like twins. Jonathan lived in that home at the time and Greg didn't and Greg wasn't actually there. So that is very important to note. Now obviously in this kind of case, friends of the accused are going to come forward and are going to say, no, my friend wouldn't do that. This isn't in his character. But not only close friends of Greg came forward, his girlfriend stayed with him through everything. She never faltered his friends, his high school coach, his girlfriend's parents, anyone in that community that knew Greg came forward and said, no, this is not Greg, this is not something he would do. He was a 17 year old boy and quite naive at that. And he was under the, the impression that most people would be, if I tell the truth, I didn't do this. If I tell the truth, nothing's gonna happen. They're gonna find out what happened and I'm gonna get released. So he was completely honest about everything. He wasn't deceptive. He was very straightforward in his answers. Didn't think of the implications of things he was saying. He didn't play any tricks or mind games. He was just 100% honest. So at this time, um, a lot of the community came together and came out in protest of what had happened to Greg um, and the fact that he had been taken into custody with no proof whatsoever. And a gentleman called Jack Bryden, who had a connection to Greg via a coach of his, um, they basically shared a common link. When he saw this old coach of his on television, and he knew him very well, he was very taken back at this coach on TV defending who was basically an alleged sex offender. So he looked more into this. And when he heard what had happened, and he heard the basis of evidence that it had happened on, none, um, he basically put the wheels in motion let everybody know, started Facebook pages, got the word out and he done, this guy just stuck with this doggedly all the way through. At a later date, which we will get to, he even helped pay for the defence for, for Greg. So um, this guy has a lot to be thanked for, it has to be said. So let's get back to the fact that Greg pretty much answered everything he was asked very openly and honestly. Now something that one of the children had said, which was uh, discussed in court, was that the perpetrator had been wearing SpongeBob square pants, pajama pants. Um, and Jonathan owned a pair of these and he was known to wear these all the time, not just at home, he wore these to college, he wore these all the time. And people that were interviewed had all said, yeah, 
He always wore them, he never had them off, they were always on him. Sometimes Greg and Jonathan would share clothes. Um, it's not something Greg wouldn't wear these pants and be out in them outside all the time, but Greg did wear them a couple of times at home and he did, when asked by the police, have you ever worn these pants? He said, yeah, I've worn them. They're Jonathan's, Jonathan's always wearing them. When Jonathan was questioned, Jonathan says, no, I, I never, I've never had, I don't, haven't seen them. I don't know what you're talking about. But everyone else is saying Jonathan wears them all the time. This just seems to have been lost in the ether and is buried and we move on. During the course of the documentary, we see Greg in prison being interviewed and at the beginning, he's a very bewildered and frightened young man, basically thinking if he tells the truth that everything will be okay. And as we move on in years, yes, years, he becomes very jaded and angry and it's very much seen that, that he's just, he can't believe what's happened to him. Um, his mother has stuck by his side this whole time, his mother that had the brain tumour. While he's in prison, he's lost his father. He's been denied that last few years of his father's life. But this young man, and I mean, he's a young, young man, a boy, maintains his dignity throughout all of this. He doesn't tell his mother half of what he's gone through inside because you can imagine being in prison for that is not gonna be easy. Those other prisoners are not gonna look easily on that. And Greg had to defend himself. He had to look after himself in there. And thankfully, he was a big, fit, strapping lad he was able to. But he went through hell in that prison and he never told any of it to his mum. He wanted her to think he was okay, he was managing. He didn't want to worry her. And that says so much to me about a young man. I mean, he was 17, 18 when he was put in prison and, and he's thinking about his mum. Okay, so well, let's get on to this lady. Her name will stick in my throat, Patricia Cummings. When Shama, Jonathan's mother, finds out about the allegations against Greg, she's aghast. She's, oh my goodness, of course I know you wouldn't have done this. Now, let me be honest, I think that there's a very high likelihood that Shama knew that her son Jonathan was guilty. I'm just going to tell you my opinion. You may disagree with that, but I'm not one not to tell you what I think. That's never been proven. Jonathan has never been charged with this. Let me get that out there first. But as the story goes on, you'll see why I come to the conclusion and everyone else that, that he did. Shama says to Greg, oh, I've got a really fantastic attorney. I'll get onto her and she'll represent you. She, you know, she's fantastic. So enter Patricia Cummings. Now, Patricia Cummings has a friendly relationship with Shama McCarty because she has represented the family before. At this stage, I think it's quite apt to say that um, Jonathan had several previous convictions, um, one of them for a lewd act against a child. So there's kind of a conflict of interest here, which is never discussed. The main other person that could be guilty in this case is the person that looks identical to the accused, who lives in the house, who wears those specific pyjama bottoms, that has a history for this kind of thing, um, but he's never investigated by the defence attorney because she's a family friend. She doesn't look into this. Shama knew about her son's history. She knew his capabilities and things he had done. Um, surely it entered her mind that possibly this wasn't Greg. It could have been her son. So this woman comes in and this woman is, you know, she's a renowned lawyer. She's good. But she gives the most negligent defence you have ever seen in your life. And this isn't just me saying this, at a later date in court, it is fine to be a conflict of interest and it's fine that he's had an inept defence. It hasn't been satisfactory, it hasn't been fair. So she's removed from the case and she actually publicly at a later date when her name is being dragged through the mud, goes on to publicly talk about how she believed this young man when she represented him but then down the line, she now thinks he did it. So she further dragged Greg's name through the mud. Um, this is his own defense attorney. So what hope has this young lad got? So on July the 8th, 2014, the trial begins. As I said before, there is no physical evidence of any description. So we have the statement from that one boy. And on this, Greg is actually convicted. Now I actually looked into this later and apparently one of those jurors did not want to convict and was pretty much put in a position where everyone else wanted to and they were exhausted, they'd been deliberating for 11 hours and he just really regrets not standing his ground and he felt pressured into giving in and they convicted Greg who was just completely, remember this is a young lad, he didn't do this, he didn't expect this to happen, he didn't expect to hear guilty and on July 16th he is actually convicted and charged of two accounts of super aggravated child assault 
which unfortunately carries uh, the lightest sentence of 25 years to life with no possibility of parole. Now, as he's about to be officially sentenced, Greg is actually what they say he's handed a lifeline of sorts. He is offered the chance not to plead guilty as such, but to accept the charge. And for that, he will get 25 years in prison. But it means he will never have the opportunity to appeal the case. But he's looking, you know, he's a very young man. He's, he's below 20. And if he gets out in 25 years, he's going to be in his 40s. He's going to have some semblance of a life. But he doesn't know what to do. He didn't do this. He asks his family, what should I do? And his brother said, look, you know, with the way things have gone and with how this investigation has gone, you could be in there for life. This has happened to other people. And his brother, they literally had minutes to make this decision. And his brother says, if it were me, I would take the 25 years. So Greg takes the 25 years um, and basically loses all right to any future appeal. So time goes on. There are so many players in this case, so much going on. Um, really, you should watch this documentary. I don't want to go into this person did this, this, but it's just so long winded. Stephanie Harlow needs to cover this to get into the tiny little gritty details. She would be amazing at this case. So over the next two years, Greg's defence team works tirelessly on this case. He has a new defence attorney by the name of Keith Hampton, who, pray to the gods, this guy it knows his stuff. This guy sticks to it. This guy believes in Greg and this guy is determined to get him some justice. But obviously, unless there's something pretty spectacular to put forward, Greg doesn't have the right to appeal. So they're working on this for two years. And on February the 11th, 2016, the appeals court affirmed the conviction. They're not going to allow appeal on it. They're, the case stands. But Greg's defence team come forward and says, no, we actually have new evidence. Now, some of the stuff I told you earlier was known at the time, but was not brought into evidence in that the, the jury never heard it. They said they could prove that Greg had moved out a month earlier. They said they could prove that he was in a completely different place at the time. But when they say Greg wasn't in the house, actually, we can prove where Greg physically was on this date. The police move the date. The police say, oh, well, perhaps that wasn't the case. That perhaps it was. And they're moving the date all around the place. They're just determined to put someone down for this, whether they're guilty or innocent. Fast forward, 25th of May 2017, the authority actually reopened the case with a new suspect, Jonathan McCarty, who it seems has 16 previous offences. So well, it looks like if you look at both these lads and their histories and the type of people they are and what people say about them, I don't know who looks more likely here. So this new evidence and new suspect is filed in the form of a writ claiming that Greg was unlawfully jailed, poorly represented and evidence that was available at the time of the first trial was not presented to the jury at the time. So while the defence team are actually waiting on a future date to put forward the new facts, the new evidence, they're gathering information all the time. And something they find out which wasn't presented at the time is that the original child described the room that the assault took place in and they described it as a trophy room, a room with lots of trophies on the wall, like sports memorabilia. And the child is very, very clearly describing Jonathan's bedroom. Now, remember I said the police never went to the house to look at the rooms, to look at whose room, what was, what the child said. The child said Greg. That's the only thing that Greg was convicted on. But it also was pointed out at a later date that the children found it really difficult to tell Greg and Jonathan apart, and a lot of them couldn't. Now, I saw pictures on the documentary myself and I couldn't tell them apart, so we're talking a four-year-old here, and is it beyond the realms of possibility that um, Jonathan perhaps called himself Greg or said he was Greg to get Greg, who he was very, very resentful of, into trouble for his actions? So if that's not enough, let's have some more information. As Jonathan is now a suspect in the case, his phone was looked through and images of child pornography were found on the phone. Also, a matter of a couple of months after Greg was arrested for the assault on the child, Jonathan is alleged to have drugged and raped a 15-year-old girl when he was 18. This is alleged to have happened at a frat party in St. Marcos. But not only was there this one assault, apparently Jonathan had numerous allegations over several counties for very similar offences. The actual victim of of the rape that we're discussing is in the documentary and does talk about it and very much I do feel that she's to be believed everything she says. The fact that he has so very many similar allegations 
But what's really strange is when he comes to court for this, he does get charged with unlawful restraint and a drugs offence, but not the actual rape. So yeah, he's admitting he drugged and tied a girl up, but he's not admitting he done anything else. Strange, but the girl was satisfied that he was, he got four years in prison, that he was basically, that people knew what he had done, that it was out there, that he wasn't going to get away with it. But at the moment, he's actually on bail, waiting appeal for this very conviction. So back to Greg. The judge sets a date for August 3rd, 2017 to see if Greg's going to be released on bail while they await a future date for proceedings to, to see what's going to happen. Meanwhile, Greg's obviously still in prison and he has at this stage reached out to Jonathan and asked to sit down and talk to him, his ex-best friend, and Jonathan denies him this. Jonathan refuses to meet with Greg. So while we're waiting for the date, um, a Texas Ranger who is a piece of work, he is in the documentary, um, keep your eye out for him. At the start, he's Greg's biggest cheerleader. He even hugs his mother outside court. He professes that he's gonna do everything he can, but he turns on Greg very, very quickly. So a Texas Ranger comes forward with an affidavit to search Greg's mobile phone. Um, and they do, and they find quite a lot of porn on there. Now, we're talking normal pornography. Let's remember, this is a teenage boy. This is a very fit, athletic um, teenage boy with a lot of hormones running through his system, who never had a phone. And the only reason he got a phone is because he was moving into someone else's home, a way to stay in touch with his parents. Teenage boy, first phone, of course he's going to go mad with this. Of course he's going to look up porn sites. What teenage boy wouldn't, really? So this is seen to have, and I, and I want to quote this, so I'm going to look down here. This gave undeniable indicators of being a sexually motivated high-risk threat. Well, there's an awful lot of sexually motivated high-risk threat teenagers out there in that case. Also, um, it is found that he supposedly had four accounts on a, a site called Adult Friend Finder, which is a site that's basically for people to meet up with people and have casual sex. And these were all like, um, basically his name with numbers after, like, I don't know, like, like G Kelly one and things like this. Now, I don't know about you, but if you're gonna sign up for something like this and you have a girlfriend that you've been with for several years, are you gonna sign up with your real name as your username? So anyway, Greg obviously admits, yeah, the porn's me, I'll admit that. There was no nothing of children, nothing to do with children on there. But he said, I've never even heard of Adult Friend Finder. I, I don't know what that is. So they went to the actual company and they requested records of these four accounts, which the actual company had no record of having ever existed. Now, is that Texas Ranger providing false information? Or... As has been suggested, did Jonathan possibly set up these accounts in Greg's name to get him into trouble? But I don't see how that could have happened if the company are saying these accounts never existed in the first place. But Greg had no idea what Adult Friend Finder was, it, and I believe him. He, he put his hand up immediately about the porn on his phone. When he was asked earlier about those pyjama pants, yeah, I borrowed them, yeah, I wore them. He hasn't proved himself to be a dishonest person. He has went through hell in prison and has lied to protect his mother and say, I'm okay, everything's all right, I'm fine. He has done the right thing in every case here. His girlfriend never wavered, never swayed, never... It would have been so easy as a young girl to say, oh, you know, did he do this? Or was he on that site? And even like hearing about some girls can be funny about porn, I don't know, but... You know, she resolutely stuck by him. She never wavered from, neither did her parents. Again, maybe as a protective father of a young girl, would you not be a bit, oh, my daughter's boyfriend's in prison for the alleged assault of a four-year-old child and he's got loads of smut on his phone? But no, they stuck religiously to him like the daughter did um, and they never, they never suspected him of being guilty at any time. On June the 8th, 2017, another affidavit is released which said that um, one of the children had serious difficulty telling Jonathan and Greg apart. Like that's a surprise to anyone that has two eyes in their head. But this cast doubt upon the original allegation. 
So on August 2017, the writ hearing commences, and on day two of the hearing, a third suspect is brought into play. We've never actually been told who this is, their name has never been announced, but there is someone else that could possibly be to blame. It comes out during this hearing about the child pornography on Jonathan's phone, and amazingly it comes out that Jonathan actually admitted he was guilty. He admitted he was guilty to numerous people while drunk at a party, um, later retracted this and said it wasn't the case, but numerous people signed affidavits to say that he had personally told them, Greg shouldn't be in prison, I did it. Meanwhile, at this stage, Greg has been in prison for three years. On August 27th, 2017, Greg is finally released on bond. To rapturous applause, to hugs from his girlfriend, to hugs from his mum. The relationship he has with his mother, Rosa, is just so, so, so sweet. I just welled up so many times watching this. Um... There's a very, very emotional scene right at the end of this with his mother when they go to a hearing about how the county handled the whole thing. You, you really you, you need to watch this documentary. And on December the 18th, 2017, the judge recommends that the case is completely overturned as he feels that enough evidence has been provided to prove that Greg is innocent. And had this evidence been put forward at the first trial, the jury could have never come to the conclusion of guilty that they actually came to. Greg is over the moon, he's absolutely ecstatic and he proposes to his girlfriend the very next day. Greg has to now go to the Court of Appeal to see if the judge's recommendation, as that's all it is, a recommendation, is actually upheld or if he will need to go back and serve the remainder of his 25 year sentence. So for the next two years, it just boggles, for the next two years, Greg logs onto the internet every Wednesday morning at 9am to check a list that has come out from the court to see if he has been, if, if it's been overturned, if he's now innocent, if he's free to live his life, every Wednesday morning for two years. This lad couldn't get on with his life. This lad couldn't get back to his high school football. And he wasn't just good. This guy was talented. This guy wanted to play for the NFL. You know, we're talking real talent here. He couldn't move on with his life. He didn't want to marry his girlfriend because he didn't know, am I going to go back and pr what's going to happen? Finally, after six years, Greg's conviction is finally overturned and he is deemed as exonerated. Six long years of this young man's life. I declare you innocent and that you are fully exonerated. A free man now with a cleared name. And right now I'm just, I'm feeling so free. Emotions were high Wednesday during Greg Kelly's exoneration hearing in Williamson County as he was given his life back. I look forward to a lot of awesome things in my life, but ultimately I just look forward to being free. Kelly was officially declared innocent and fully exonerated in the very courtroom where he was originally sentenced to 25 years in prison for aggravated sexual assault of a child more than half a decade ago. I've been dreaming of this day. It felt like the past six years have been a nightmare for me. Um, but to be declared fully innocent and me to go on with my life, um, it's an absolute blessing. While behind bars, the former Leander High School football player maintained his innocence and never gave up hope. Prison was a, was a place full of, full of terrifying experiences for me, but it was also a place where I found God. Three years into his sentence, he was released on bond following new evidence in the case. Evidence which would ultimately overturn his original guilty verdict. From here on out, um, I found a new sense of freedom. Uh, I think uh, it's fair to say that I, I can appreciate freedom more than anybody right now. As this case comes to a close, the work for Kelly is far from over. He plans to hold Cedar Park police accountable for how they initially handled this case. People like that having a badge is completely terrifying. And ultimately, I would be scared to death to live in Cedar Park knowing that a detective can literally point you out, label you out, and solely seek out an investigation no matter if there's another assailant or not. From the friends and family who never gave up on him, Kelly says he has a lot to be thankful for on the day before Thanksgiving. And as for the future, he's looking forward to his wedding in January. As it stands, no one has ever been charged with the assault on that four-year-old um, and it's from all research that I did, it seems very unlikely that Jonathan will ever be charged, that anyone will ever be charged and you have to feel some sense of grief for the parents and the child because there's, I very much doubt there's any argument that this happened but it's just unfortunate that the wrong person um, suffered and went to prison due to this. 
when we look at the similarity in appearance, when we look at the clothing, when we look at the bedroom, when we look at the proof on the telephone, the previous convictions and, you know, assaults on girls, child pornography on his telephone, then we have a lad that has never done a thing wrong in his life, that is like a normal red-blooded young teenage boy that likes pornography, um, he has a long-term girlfriend, everyone supports him. I know who my money's on. In January of this year, 2020, Jonathan actually married his long-term girlfriend and biggest supporter, Gabri. Uh, they had a beautiful wedding ceremony together and they moved back to the Cedar Park area. Now, a gentleman I spoke about earlier that came forward as a massive supporter of Greg didn't even know him but had the connection via a coach. Well, he actually gave Greg um, space in a building that he owns for a new endeavour that Greg had started called Tomahawk Targets, which makes custom-made throwing boards and cornhole sets. I have no idea what cornhole sets is. Enlighten me. <laughs> He's also continuing his education and is enrolled as a student of Texas University. He has been training out and trying really really hard and, and he is hoping to play for the University of Texas very soon. So thank you so much for listening. I think you will agree this is something of a tragic case for two reasons. We have a young man that's lost six years of his life here that has lost so much opportunity and we have a child here that there's been no conviction for, for the abuse that they suffered. So the whole thing is just a desperate big mess. But I'm very pleased that Greg is out. Um, there is a lot of interviews of him on YouTube. I've watched quite a few today. Um, he just seems like a lovely young man, just really polite. It's just a shame that he lost those six years when he perhaps could have been doing He could have been playing for the NFL. He was seriously such a talented young player. But... Much love to Greg and Gabri um, and hopefully many years of happiness for them both. Um, it just shows the real true testament to a proper loving, supportive relationship that she knew right from the start that he wasn't guilty and she stuck by him every step of the way. And massive kudos to her parents for doing the same thing because that's something I think the parents of young girls, very, very few would actually do. So major kudos to her parents there too. So thank you for listening. Um, let me know what you think below in the comments. Um, as I've said, all the information provided I have garnered from the documentary and from further reading. But if there are errors, please feel free to correct me below in the comments. Thank you so much.